Hello, cinephiles! We're headed back to the Director's Guild for another FYC event, and this one is for the Star Wars television show Andor on Disney+. Plus. So are you ready? Baba Freak is ready. Let's go! Oh, hello, hi there. It's me, Todd. I'm in the studio. And today's sponsor is myself. The best way to support the channel is to subscribe to my Patreon, where not only do you become a member of the community, you get early access to the B-side videos as well as watch-throughs of movies or TV shows we are covering, and other movie reactions and commentaries from a filmmaker's perspective. And if that's out of your budget, no worries. Just hit that like button. It really does help out the channel with the algorithm. And of course, subscribe to get the latest videos delivered directly to you. Hit that notification bell to be alerted of the newest uploads. And please, share these videos with your friends and family. And now, back to our regularly scheduled program. Now you're, now you're in trouble. Sir, are these some droids you're looking for? <laughs> Happy Sunday, all. Thanks so much for coming out to spend an afternoon with the creative team behind Andor. We're going to try to make sure that we have some time for a few audience questions towards the end, so give some serious thought to things you want to know. Uh, but I'm Dan Feinberg, Chief Television Critic for The Hollywood Reporter. And let's welcome our excellent panelists. Up first, he plays prisoner turned revolutionary, revolutionary Kino Loy, Mr. Andy Serkis. <laughs> She's an executive producer and an Emmy winner for Chernobyl, Sanaa Wallenberg. Director of films including Michael Clayton, Tony Gilroy, <laughs> he previously played Cassie and Andor in Rogue One, and here he's the star and executive producer. Welcome, Diego Luna. of technology, uh, we should have Marva and or herself, Fiona Shaw, somewhere. <laughs> there we are! I'm amazed that anything works technologically, so there she is. Uh, before we begin, uh, we're going to watch a clip from the climactic scene of One Way Out. You might know it as Kino Loy's big speech, big monologue. Let's give it a watch. We never seen, we never, uh, we saw one, two, and three on the big screen, but we never, we've never seen the rest of it. I want to start, Andy, with you, because I don't know that I realized it watching on my TV the multiple times I've watched it, just how close the camera was to you for so long. I didn't realize how close it was. Only <laughs> I mean, just realized, only I mean, just realized how close it was. Wow. It's pretty, I mean, I'm going to have to show you, really. <laughs> Okay, lots of shows are afraid to do speeches and monologues because it's the kind of thing where if you say, okay, this is going to be the big thing that's going to rouse everyone to action and then it's anticlimactic or disappointing, you pretty much kill the show because it can't go anywhere. This is a show that loves its big speeches. I want to start with Andy and Fiona. When you know, when you see on your sheet, tomorrow's the day I do my three-minute monologue, how does that change your process and your looking forward to that day? 
Fiona, would you, yeah, hello. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you want to go first? It certainly changes your sleeping pattern. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was very pleased to sleep. And I learnt it going wrong. So I ran every day and learnt it for weeks. So I was excited when it, when it was the day. I was, I was, um, I, I was, you know, you, 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 the thing is, when it's a great speech, when it's written well, and when you really believe in the writing, and when you're working with great filmmakers, great directors, but also someone who clearly has written an inspiring series, I mean, and, and you get a page like that. It, it, it doesn't, the words don't come easily if they don't mean anything to you, or you don't connect with them. And, and to have an arc of a character, I think, that, that had that at the end of it, and someone who's finding himself because of the inspiration of, you know, truthfully engaging with someone who, who reminds him of who he is. It's, it, it was just, it all felt very grounded and real, and it didn't feel like a speech. It felt like an in-the-moment kind of uh, exploration of, Finding yourself, and I think I think that was that was that was you know hopefully what, what was coming across. That's what I was thinking. So I, so it, it wasn't it was it was because I love the way that Tony wrote that beginning, which is you know he had to find the confidence. He had did have a voice, used to have a voice, but no longer had a voice, and then found it again. And that's that's something I think again it's an emotional thing that people can plug into. So yeah, I, I, it, it was it's scary. It is scary, but uh, but I, I felt at least that. It came out of a kind of a truth, a, a truth of the character. And Andy, you at least had the opportunity to be doing this in front of a large group of people who you were supposed to be able to be inspiring. Were you able to look to the, to the co-stars, I mean, Diego, obviously, but also all of the other actors, to sort of know if you were getting it right at all? Could you see if you were inspiring people? Well, it, well actually, no, because, uh, you know, there was, there was just the, the other guards there, and then and, and it was just us two in the room. So it, it, it was, uh, well, I, mean, I was getting an enormous amount of calls from Diego. <laughs> <laughs> I was on my phone, yeah. <laughs> And Fiona, because yours was this, your big speech in the finale is this strange hologram situation, so was there anyone there with you at all? Who was giving you reinforcement? Um, I was alone. <laughs> and I was in the studio. There was nobody around because everybody had to hide so the hologram could do its thing, which is multiple cameras all around you. So every now and then, a god would speak to me through a microphone and I would uh, repeat it or do what was necessary. So it was the most unusual thing I'd ever done in my life. <laughs> and Diego, at the point at which we meet Cassian in this series, he's not the guy who could make this big speech. He's not the rousing firebrand yet. How does that impact how you look at where the character is in the series versus the guy you played in Rogue One? Well, that's that. That's the point, right? It's it's a uh, it's the guy that needs to listen, you know. It's the guy that needs to absorb, and uh, and and it's 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 basically a beautiful also uh, way to get to know all these characters, you know, because everyone that means something uh, for this character will get to meet, right? So it's about witnessing, uh, and it's about yeah taking it in uh, it's for me also it's great because I don't speak English as, you know, as good as Andy or, or Fiona so <laughs> gladly I didn't get to give the speeches uh, <laughs> uh, otherwise Nicolas Britel would have had to bring more and more strings or something to, to make it work. Uh, but uh, but no, it's 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 interesting to see that because this this series and, and uh, is 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 a team uh, that works together, you know, uh, not just Tony but the editors and uh, that there is a, there is a language that is different, which we spend a lot of time here seeing who listens, you know, it's not it's not like TV where the camera is always with the person talking, you know, this speech we just saw. 
it's it's very inspiring. It's beautiful to see Andy, but it's also beautiful to see the reaction. You know, beautiful to see the faces of all these people finding hope and realizing and understanding and moving forward. And this series is about that. It's about it's about the reaction. It's about the people. It's about a revolution. You know. And, and Tony, you have theater literally in your blood. You you have a theatrical background that goes through your family. Do long speeches, do they come naturally to you, or do you, as a writer, or do you have to be refining a speech like that more than maybe anything else in a show like this? Um, they're not, I've done a lot of them. I did a lot of them, you know, I guess Devil's Advocate was probably a pretty big educational experience. Um, there's a lot of, and I found writing for Satan was really easy. Um, <laughs> But they, they, um, I hate to like, I hate to take the piss out of it, but they, they're easy, they're, they're not the hardest thing to do if, you, if, if you're feeling it. You know, really, if, if you're feeling it, they're not hard to do. There's many other things that are harder to write. If you get plugged into it, um, uh, what's my hook? My hook on Fiona's speech is, she says, I'm trying to find my way into it. Well, the idea that you would be giving your own eulogy is in, already, just the, the setting of it is fantastic because you think, oh my God, it's just three or four days or a week beforehand. It's the last moment where she thought she was healthy enough to do this. And she made this, so all the things that we talked about, like what did she have to do and, to get ready? So that's powerful. But for me, the hook was, um, what does she say? She says, I, you know, I remember coming with my sister and holding my sister's hand all the way from Fountain Square. And so I have that, and that, and when I have that, then I, then I'm plugged in. I'm like, oh, okay, I know what this is now. And, um, and uh, I'm all, I do always, it's very personal, the speech for me, because I, I always, I'm, a, I'm very critical of public speaking. I'm very into it, eulogies and wedding speeches and stuff. I always like when people really nail it. And I always want to be, I really want to be lifted. I always want to be inspired. I'm always disappointed when I'm not. There's a lot of me in that <laughs> A lot, so I'm plugged in, and um, um, Andy's speech, um, the hook for me there is the, the line that kind of got me plugged in was when he said, if you see somebody who's hurt, if you see somebody who's wounded, if you see somebody who's confused, help them out. And like in most prison stories, people are against each other, the prisoners are against each other. Our show is so much about community, you know, and, and the disruption of community. And that's then I'm emotional. That that it still breaks my heart when I say it right now. It makes me I feel it. So those are like my little talents. And then it's not like they write themselves, but they're not they're not as hard as bringing seven people into a room that you never met who didn't who are disagreeing about something and you got to tell a plot point. That's hard to do. <laughs> but given that perfectionist streak in you. Are you able to watch, I mean, you just obviously watched it, but how much are you able to watch these speeches without something just getting into your gut and wanting to rewrite everything constantly? Well, when I was a writer and I was working for other people, that was just, <laughs> that was life. <laughs> that was life. I'm, I don't have, I'm in control now. I, I have to stand behind everything that's here. I'm in charge. I, I, I don't do that. Go like that, Andy, again, do the whole thing. It's just, that's what I worked for. We should have to didn't make a speech when we rap now. <laughs> so this show, I was constantly amazed watching it because it's a show that very much is about the encroachment of capitalism and money into people's civil liberties and the way that they can turn institutions sour, whether it's politics or the prison industrial complex. And I was constantly amazed that this was a theme you were able to poke at in a Star Wars property that was being released by the Walt Disney Corporation, which seems to generally enjoy capitalism very much. <laughs> I'm going to try to short circuit that, <laughs> and not for not for cheesy reasons either. But uh, I do want to disengage the. It's and you wrote a great article recently. You wrote a great article recently about a lot of shows and, and tying together this moment and this you know gestalt of all these different shows. Um, 
I'm not against capitalism, and I'm not against uh, theme parks or, 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 or anything, but it's about oppression it, to me. The show is about, it's about oppression and imperialism and the destruction of community and the destruction of free will and, 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 and just generally what we would all comfortably describe as fascism. It's an anti-fascist show. It's not a pro-capitalist show. To get pinned down like it's, it's been so tempting for many months for people to go oh this is this and this is that and this is this and um, I and my answer is a, it's it sounds like it's self-serving but it's but it's true I'm literally cherry picking through all the crap I've been reading for 60 years all the history all the junk I've read every revolution all the political amateur historian crap I've ever paid attention to so it's a chance for me to cherry pick and I get chap. I could go chapter and verse on every single revolutionary moment in here and give you 15 different places where it happened over the last 4,000 years of history. So I don't want to be pinned down to this moment or this particular conversation. Given that, how often? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love Pirates of the Caribbean. I love it. <laughs> how often, though? Did you take a pause, and this can go also for the actors, and go, I can't believe I'm getting away with this at this scale in this situation. Like, this is a serious conversation you want to have, whether it's the conversation that I started with or the conversation you transitioned into. It's a serious conversation. I just mentioned Devil's Advocate 10 minutes ago. I mean, I don't know. I've been sneaking shit through for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you one thing. And it, because the other day I got to this, I, I started thinking this way, like I grew up uh, in a family where they told me this was impossible, basically. Where uh, something I would like as audience to see, something that would be interesting to me, that would challenge me as audience, that would have the tone of acting I care for, that would have the voices that I, I, I would look for and seek for when I'm, when I'm looking at what's next for me to see. I, I learned that it was impossible that something I would care about would be also popular and could be part of a franchise like this, you know? And uh, I, I, I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that, you know, it's uh, at the same time, as you were saying, it, I don't think it, it should just apply for what it says. It's just like the experience, the filmmaking like, that is behind this show and the, the passion and the, the talent behind the show is incredible. It's incredible, you know, the amount of the, the actors behind the show, the designs, the, the music, everything is, and you go like, really? Is, is all this money being used to do something that cool? Holy shit, where are we? What's going on? You know, that's not the world, I, I, that's not where I decided to be an actor. These things were not happening. Star Wars arc has been so much about revolution. And we watched the first movies and it was like, okay, here's the rebellion. Here's where it started. And then with Rogue One, you said, okay, no, this is actually kind of where it started. Mm -hmm. And I like that Andor is like, okay, you thought it started there. Here's where it started five years earlier. <laughs> when did you decide after Rogue One that there was a story that you wanted to tell beyond that that involved these characters and this build up? They, uh, it's really simple. They, they wanted to do all kinds of things after Road One. Um, uh, Lucasfilm's fortunes changed, you know, with the economy and with every other thing. They wanted to do a show, but streaming wasn't there. There wasn't money to really make a Star Wars show. They tried a couple times, but it's really hard to do this. It's you know, it it, it takes a big gamble. These are, you can't do Star Wars cheap. You can't. You can't half-ass it. You really, it's like you can't do James Bond, a low rent, you gotta do it. So the, the meeting of the moment had to be when the economics and the, and the idea could meet. And the idea was always, wow, uh, give us these five years, let's take this character back to the point where he's a, he's, you know, a, a roach crawling out of a hole. Let's pick him up on the worst day of his life and let's see if we can get him over five years to turn him into the guy who was in Rogue One. That'll be interesting. And that was, that was the conversation. It was much more about the character than it was about, 
And then, and then they give you the five, those five years that are mine. I get those five years, that's my area, and no one's gonna mess with that. So those, that's what we have. So we have five years of to curate, and we know all about those five years, what we can do, what we can't do. But, but it's more about the characters. When in this process did it feel like you were making a part of the biggest multi-zillion dollar franchise in the world, and when did it feel like you were making the Ken Loach movie of this? Well, I think, I think the, the, what it felt like was always felt authentic, and that's something that, you know, we, we live in a world of you know, algorithms telling us what to do and what to make and, and how to present material and how to, you know, this didn't feel like that at all. It felt from the off very analog and that's the beauty of it it felt it feels everything's tangible everything's real everything's grounded the sets were all built you know there was there wasn't a sense of you know trying to it, it just always felt authentic and I, and I think that's I think we've been so terrified about being authentic as filmmakers and 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 and, and you know writers at the moment are you know, you have to fit a mold, you have to fit a market, you have to do it for this particular audience, you have to hit the, you know, and it's like, this feels like it's just telling a story for real, and, 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 and I, I really responded to that, and so it always felt in safe hands, and always felt like it was, it, it was something tangible. Diego or Fiona? Yeah, I'm going to pass it to Fiona first, if you, because... She has to unmute. Right, well, um, many things there. I, I, Zana was like a Marva and or herself when we got to Pinewood because she, she made that really dark month of January and February of 2020 bearable by her bonhamous welcome and her incredible ease, uh, even when we were all terrified. And we had Tony speaking to us from New York. So it was a bit like being in another universe, but also that the universe of the piece is about a moral universe. And the genius of Tony and his writing is that all the heroes are reluctant heroes. Either they're prisoners who are escaping or a woman who just wants to you know, run her business in Ferrix, uh, who's forced to get her son to wake up. Um, it's the reluctance of it that makes it really easy to identify with as an ordinary person. I, I would add that uh, I'm going to say a few things. First of all, I, th I think we also owe a little bit to, to Rogue One. You know, and with and not just what Rogue One is, but what Tony brought there and what started there. Uh, uh, you know, it's different times. That was long ago, but it was taking risks too, and he was bold. You know, and and there was a character like Cassian Andor that had a weird accent, looked different, and uh, happened to be the guy that at the end, you know, sacrifices everything. And you go like, really? Is that gonna be the guy? <laughs> I thought he was gonna die like in the second act. That's, that's when those guys die, and then someone goes like, "Shirt, <laughs> do something about it." You know, it didn't happen that way. So I think, I think, I mean, we have to understand where this character comes from, you know, and. Therefore, if it was going to be Tony Gilroy, he was just going to take it even further, right? And and we were all here because of that, because of that possibility, because that was there was a seed there. And uh, I would say when you when you say like when when do you feel you're doing Star Wars? It's like when when you talk about a deal, you know, with an agent or a lawyer, and, and shit, you have to read those four hundred pages. You. you Clearly, you're heading into something that <laughs> deserves some advice and, and, and thinking. And <laughs> you cannot just get drunk and go like, yeah, let's do the field play. Yes, of course, I'm there tomorrow. Now you're going to move. Okay. Um, and the secrecy. The secrecy, you don't have to be quiet about something you love, you know, like, I'm gonna do a theater play, what am I gonna, like, people, is not gonna come to see it, they won't come either, I mean, even if I talk about it, you know? <laughs> so, clearly here, that that's different, but, but I, I would say that that's it, because we, and we also have to agree uh, that we were given so much freedom, to actually execute this thing. And we were there every day and we had the resources and we had the stages and we had the time. And 
I every day was like, really, is this gonna keep going like this, or or you know, one day the lights gonna come on and it's like enough, guys. Okay, here's the new script, here's the new writer, and move away. Here's the new actor, you know. But no, we got to the point where we were talking about our show, like, as if we were talking about a tiny little project we wanted to do together, and uh, it's been like that from scratch. It's been beautiful, you know. It's gonna spoil at least me. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's been extraordinary to support the freedom that you know we were <clears throat> we, had, we had to kind of get on with this and and bring it to the screen definitely. I'm gonna go down one more avenue and then I will try to take a few more questions. Um, Tony, as a as a TV critic, I always blanch when people say, "Oh, it's gonna be a ten hour movie," or "I'm looking at this as a twelve hour movie," or whatever. The structure of this series is a very interesting and specific thing. So it's not a twelve hour movie. It's kind of three or four extended multi-episode chapters. When did you find what the structure of this was supposed to be? It, it, it's been evolving all the way. You know, there's a lot of shows that don't know where, like we talked about before, that don't know where they're gonna end and don't know where their end is. And that's a big, that's the crippler of young adults. And right, many people are suffering from trying to figure out where the show should go. But uh, our show was trying to figure out what the structure of it would be. So the original plan was to do five seasons in some vain, glorious moment of agreement on that. Uh, yeah, sure, we'll do five. Yeah, what's, yeah, we'll be like 98 years old. And like, and they'll have de-aging really figured out by then. <laughs> but um, so uh, the structure of, of how it went in the first I mean, I, I, it, it really is a combination of, of like super confidence, uh, naivete, and, and some lunacy in, the, in, in doing the first season. Uh, when we realized that we couldn't possibly do another four, what we're doing now for the second season, uh, for the, for, to finish, is we have four years to cover. So we're making, again, because we, we break down in these three block uh, chunks, each block of three will be a year. We're going to jump. A year when you come when we come back from the for the second half we'll come back a year will have evaporated and it'll take place over a Friday Saturday and a Sunday and then we'll jump a year and we'll do the same thing again we'll do it four times and the last the last tranche will be the four days or three days before Rogue One and we'll walk you into the movie so the structure was um, the structure came well the structure came of desperation and of of, <laughs> of, of, of luck yeah, and of need and of drinking some scotch up at pit lockery and going like you know i don't think we'll make it this way and um, so uh i i do think that because so many people this is such an inside business crowd here this is such an inside baseball crowd i think <laughs> what? There's social media uh, today. Uh, but, uh, but not the people that are in here. Right? But anyway, the, um, there's got to be a lot of writers in here and, 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 and filmmakers in here. I think it's amazing. Uh, a couple, if you ask me, like the two biggest developments in my life as a dramatist would be uh, uh, one is that you don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be a sympathetic character. The character has to be fascinating, not sympathetic. I was beaten to death for the first half of my life with sympathetic characters. You know, oh, can, can he have a dog? You know, I mean, he's, 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 you sit for two hours in the, he's not two hours, you sit in eight, for eight hours in the Carlisle Hotel listening to your actor tell you he needs a dog. We've all been there, right? Um, but, so, I mean, I think Tony Soprano finally put the stake in that heart. It was, a, it was not just about that, but he was the final. But the second thing is almost more important. It's like, if you're a writer, all the shit you got on your console, I can do this, these are the words, these are the tone, these are the, all my stuff. There's a whole new dial on the thing, which is how long should my thing be? It doesn't have to be 125 pages anymore with all the white. It could be, wow, maybe this is good at four, maybe this is good at seven. That dial is a new toy. I think everybody's figuring out how to use it. Some people, some people are making mistakes with it, which is, a good thing, and some people are getting lucky with it, which is a good thing. And uh, that dial isn't going anywhere. That's what we were talking about. That's what I think is really um, you have a piece of material. Where does it really sit? As long as you're not warping it and you're cutting it to the to the lot. You want to build to the lot. You know, you look at it like a property. I right, we're going to do our lot. We're going to build a house. Well, what's the lot? You want to you don't want to have the house fill the whole lot. You want to have it be perfect. And I think that's an amazing time. I'm so happy I live long enough to see that and just get out right before AI. That's my goal. <laughs> I 
I'm going to say something since we are here that it's also important, uh, which is there is a director for each block of this, yeah. you know, so there is there is that integrity also. This is not a show where you want directors to come and do the exact same thing the other guy was doing, right? It's like voices that come and become part of this. So uh, one, two, three that you saw as one thing was one director and there's one voice that uh, approaches it with a beginning and an end because they are, they, they connect and they disconnect and someone else comes in and brings another flow, another language. E even the, the visual language changes, you know, and, and it's beautiful because the, the, the series keeps evolving, but that gives some rhythm of like three episodes, you know, that end up being in four blocks already from, from the first season. And now on this one, it's gonna be even, even more clearer. You know? Yeah, we haven't talked enough about the directors. I know we don't, but I mean, that, that's a really important point. And that's really, that's, that's, I mean, Zana taught me how to do this. I mean, I, I didn't know how to do this. But, you know, the directors are really such a huge part of this, obviously. And, and I think, you know, what Tony and we were always looking for as filmmakers at their own heart that, you know, buy into the DNA of, of, of Tony's vision and, and what I know is, but really bring a lot to it. And in that sense, we also, work very much in the European system of very, very long prep periods with the directors to really kind of dig into this and work with, you know, the design and, you know, the effects, the actors, and, and, and really, you know, to get there. But the, so by the time we're turning over, we really, you know, we really have been on a very intense journey and we were very much blessed on, on season one. You know, we had um, three wonderful directors, um, one of which doing you know, six episodes in the end in two blocks. Um, and, you know, yes, and they, you know, they really, without that element, you know, the, the end product you see and how, you know, you see Tony's, you know, beautiful writing brought to screen would not be what it is. We don't have a writer on set. People would say, I don't, I'm not on set. Is I could I'll visit I'll but it's not it's not a good look really, and, <laughs> but I don't. But people say who's your writer on set? No. When we get there, everybody knows what they're doing and they're ready to step <coughs> away. That's our process. Well, and I know you'd wanted to direct in the first season, but the scheduling got in the way. Are you COVID? Yeah, no, we would have just. I, I had we, <laughs> the idea that I ever would have done this. I was prepping to do the first three episodes before COVID, and then COVID happened. And I went home, and then. <laughs> I ended up writing for two more years, so like, I don't know how I was ever, uh, this show would have been destroyed. It, COVID no saved the show. Let's just be honest, COVID saved the show. Me not directing saved the show. COVID was terrible, but we didn't have done something for us. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do my best to, okay, so I saw your hand go up, so. Um, I just want to say this show is absolutely amazing. She just said this show is absolutely amazing. <laughs> that was her question. <laughs> Thank you for giving us a grown up Star Wars. Sorry, I gotta, I'll do the Spanish later. <laughs> Tell us your Emmy voter. Are you an Emmy voter? <laughs> Rebellion for yourself or for your mom? Did your mom make you do it? I like. I would say, me, Diego, totally. It was the mom. It was the mom. If my mom had said anything like that, I would have done it. Like it's, it's so powerful. No, but I, I think he 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 wants to join, but now he has to find out what is that. You know, uh, like he 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 loves. He loves the idea, but now he has to learn the language, right? So uh, he doesn't know yet. Therefore, there's another whole season to go for. But definitely, it's like, you know, it's, it's 
<laughs> it's been there always, you know, from scratch, your mom. And, and, and when you get it is when she's not there. I mean, I think that's, I don't know if that's what he wanted to write, but to me it was like, holy crap, that's, it's, it's, it's when most of the times is when the person is not there anymore that you're ready to understand. Because she says that often, before, many times, in many ways, but, uh, but it's when she's not there that he's ready um, to lay it I faced this question so often when we did so you know we did the whole press rollout. So the question came all the time. And the answer that that works the best for me is I think there's an arrogance that I have, that we all have, that we live in some special moment. I think everybody who's lived in history has an arrogance that they're in a place that's the most different and unusual. And I don't I think that uh, uh, the sad truth is that the the Catherine wheel of of uh, friction and oppression and rebellion is just, it's from the moment that people, you know, found the, found the first piece of meat to argue over. I don't know what it is. And, I, and I, 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 I do, I'm not unaware of the comps. I've seen all the things I'm not unaware of. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, when I did Michael Clayton, Michael Clayton was for me about the Iraq war. I was so angry with the Iraq war that I wrote Michael Clayton. And does Michael Clayton have anything to do with the Iraq war? No, it doesn't. But uh, do I think that there's Cheney and Rumsfeld in that movie? Yes, I do. And like, so, uh, you know, it's my thing, and it's a little bit of that. It doesn't help me to pin it down. I, it feels good that people respond, and it means something to them in the present. But I, I hope it drives people back to, uh, you know, boy, the, the, the history of revolutions and, the, you know, going back 4,000 years is just, it's fascinating. It's like I said, it's about families. They're all different and they're all the same. It's, it's an amazing uh, thing. But I think we're a little bit arrogant about where we live. Let's go. Uh, uh, just kind of in, uh, with the constraints of filmmaking kind of turning into this more cinematic television with much larger budgets, this is primarily for the actors. You know, you guys are all big film actors. How do you feel about the freedoms to explore your characters over longer periods of time? He asked how the actors feel about getting the opportunity to explore characters over a longer period of time than necessarily you would in a film. I think this this long format is like a perfect playground for actors. Uh, and I say this because for me, knowing the ending is really important. <laughs> Uh, knowing there is an end, but also knowing where you're heading, you know. Uh, that doesn't mean you cannot react to the accident uh, on the way, but uh, but that's the big difference to me, you know. When when you all have a name and uh, and we all understand what that is, uh, and then this format is 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 pure joy, you know, because you get to explore and go and and, and bring to the surface stuff that never gets. Never, never gets to leave your own process, you know. And here you put it out there, and uh, and you let others react to it, and and, and things happen. Uh, I, I, I am very happy with this 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 idea of having a long time. It feels feels like a theater workshop that doesn't end, you know, <laughs> uh, where everything is welcome. Also, I mean, but I think uh, it's very unfair to speak like this because I'm talking about this project. I'm talking about this team, I'm talking about these people, I'm talking about this cast. It's here where that, uh, where, where I play that game, you know? I don't know, I, I can't compare this to the experience of anyone else. Andy, if you want to, you guys have an answer? Well, I mean, it was um, astonishing to play somebody 20 years younger than <laughs> and then 20 years older. So that was a different kind of long form. But if it's exactly as Diego says, is that you get a chance to dare to go in a cul-de-sac for a moment before coming back onto the main story. And that is a real 
uh, it's painterly, you know, it allows you to develop and learn something even from what you're playing. Well, I want to take that question actually from the other side of it because on one hand, Diego has 24 episodes to play this character, but on the other hand, because of the structure that Tony established, um, Andy, you got to come in for three episodes, have a very, very clear arc, you know, just, just it's a movie character right there in the middle of the TV show. And Fiona got to be, I believe, in five episodes. How much of your being able to do this show at all was because of the, the tranche system, as Tony put it, that, that, you know, three episodes and out? No, I mean, that, that was, for me, that was, that was part of the appeal because, I, because you know, uh, it, for me, that really excites me that I can see, as Diego was saying, you know, a beginning, middle, and an end is, is very appealing for a part. And I, or much as though I do, I, I mean, I, I've not done a lot of television, and, um, I, I, and the things that I have done have been short form TV and, and you know, single dramas and so on. So, so, so really, I've, I've, this is my first time doing something like this, but I really, really enjoyed the, the process of, of just having that airtime to, to, you know, although the, the plot is happening thick and fast and there's a lot going on, they always seem to, to it just did always feel like, like there was room for the, for, the, for the subtle moments, for the detail, for the psychology, for the emotion, and you know, to, to, to you know, to explore that in a meaningful way, and not and not feel like you're having to make sort of just you know sort of broad statements about the character to, to service the plot. You know, so so absolutely. I mean, I I, I found it. I, I really really loved the the pro the process on this. It was amazing, and, and to work with such fine actors, it was you know, it's it was a real playground. Those that the Narkina Five experience was a good one. You know. <laughs> The COVID test the tubes <laughs> that we had to walk through. Yeah, yeah. It almost felt counterproductive. <laughs> How about you, Fiona? Uh, I'm looking up at you as if you can see me looking up at you. But um, <laughs> was the fact that this was a, a finite kind of role, was that something that also appealed to you, that you could come in and do these, these few scenes, few episodes, and then move on to, no doubt, many other things? Well, I'm very regretful now that I'm dead. But <laughs> Tony was very clear at the beginning that I was going to die. So I really did know that I was going to have that end. And it is very good. You can structure it and you can, um, you can play with the known and the unknown. I mean, it was also very interesting to work with Diego, who we met masked and then suddenly had to demask when we had these huge uh, maternal sun rows. And that was very unusual because um, it's amazing that acting does work. It really works. You don't need to have been planning this from years back. That was, that was really something I learned. Another thing also is that, um, and, and I, I would say uh, that, let me find out how I want to say it. Uh, no, the anxiety that not knowing what will happen, you know, distracts you as an actor, you know, really, really, this, this new form of approaching where you're, you have to be open to anything, you know, it's, it's so bizarre, it's so anti-natural, you know, you want to you wanna commit to an idea, then you can change your mind, but you, you need to commit, and in this show, we, we committed because, as Tony said, He's not on set reminding us. He he tells us everything we need to know for the moment you were there. You know, everything is prepared. Everyone knows where we're going. It's it's quite I mean it's quite unique if you see or ask people how TV is being done today. That that we have that time. Like directors work for three months. They don't get to set to find out how they're gonna solve something, you know. And uh, that's the only way you can get away to with a show this this size. And we know that obviously the series is going to a certain destination with Diego's character. But on the other hand, you did Rogue One and then decided to come back to this world. And just off the top of my head, we, we know that Kino, at least in theory, is still alive. That's a storyline that you could return to. While um, Marva is not alive, there's a lot of backstory involving Marva and Cassian and you know, their relationship that presumably we aren't going to get to see. Can you imagine yourself wanting to revisit 
this world and come back and do another series <laughs> in Nirvana, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you talking to? Prob probably Tony. I mean, man, look, I... <laughs> or, you, or you can finish Andor. Two days Andor, ago, but... not because of the strike, our, because our thing rhymed with the strike, I finished the last script of the 24, the final just thing. So we started three and a half years ago. We will have, it'll be five years by the time we're done to finish. Uh, I haven't not had a mountain in front of me for three and a half years. And, we, and then we finished one, we're like, oh my God, we gotta finish one, make up two, mix, and then we gotta go sell it while we're doing it. It's just, it's, it's not a, I'm so played out right now, I can't imagine what I would do. I'm just gonna try to get through and like, we gotta finish shooting in August and like, then we'll do what we're gonna do. I, I wouldn't make any, I'm not buying a boat right now. <laughs> but I don't know, man. Uh, I'm just so happy to be done. I don't have any writing homework, really. So, I'm so happy. And you're ruining it. <laughs> My apologies. Very sincere. In the, in this, I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to do this again. No, I don't think so. In this format, the, the best way to describe it is like there's never a time to celebrate. You know, you don't, you, you, I mean, you can't have a hangover. It's impossible. It's impossible. I, I mean, no, he talks a good game, but the three, they're actors. Let's just face it. <laughs> Donna and I have not, we have not, we have ruined relationships, friendships, we've destroyed our lives. We like, we have not had a fucking day off in three and a half years, not really. Like we went away and we did a couple things that we like. We tend to be on vacation, but we're texting, and we're like looking at Atris, and I don't know about her, I'm going to get back on the boat when I get two more days of vacation. We have, man, we're... <laughs> I think we're going to chill a little bit. Okay, so that's, so that's a maybe. So. <laughs> they're actors, they're going to go on to their other thing and not have hangovers and go to work, but they're every day. And as a last thing, um, you mentioned having finally finished or having finished a version of the final scripts. Um, my understanding is you guys are putting out these scripts along oh, with some concept art? Yes, this is our big, yeah. So, uh, oh, I, I'm really happy about this. It makes me weirdly happy because um, of all the movies I ever worked on, all the, everything, you never end up at the end with a proper script. You always end up with this crazy freaking golden, double golden rod piece of shit. <laughs> and you finish and you like run to the hills and you like edit the movie or whatever. So it's like, at once we did Clayton, they wanted to publish it, so we like cleaned it up or whatever. But the way we do this show and the way it worked and, and because we do it in this weird system, we, and because we have, I have a, I never had a script assistant, we have this amazing guy, David Gerber on whatever. We have, like we finished up, we have like 12 perfect scripts, and they are the actual documents that we use. They're like working documents, but they're they're pretty. I never had pretty scripts before. Very important for Tony to have a pretty I script. I like a pretty <laughs> script. They're very pretty. And so, at the end, they're like, oh, what should we put the, and I go like, well, can we just, so we're gonna, there's enough people that seem, you know, people seem interested, writers are interested, so we're gonna put out all 12, just as they are, and then we have all of our, um, uh, this was new to me too. I never used concept art successfully before. Concept art on this show is just invaluable, and it's just it's just been an eye opener. So we have this um, remarkable collection of of concept art. Um, so we're going to put out a, a a website, and it's just it's going to be super simple, no jazzy shit. It's going to be all twelve scripts, just as they are. I mean, as they were. And then we're gonna match, then there'll be a section of the concept art, and it'll be able to link if you want to, oh, this was the concept art. And we're just gonna put it out, like a sort of uh, words and images thing. Um, we'll put it out for free, but we don't have the, we do not have the proper URL at this point yet, and there will be a big thing, but we have, Cynthia, what do we have yet? The URL is up there? They're gonna put it up, what are they gonna do? I can't remember what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> we're gonna, there's a temporary URL, but it's coming. We're gonna put that out. If anybody's, in, I mean, there's a lot of writers that are interested in that stuff, and it's, I'm, I'm very, it's all there, and I'm very, I'm very pleased with how they are. So I've never done anything like that. So I'm, that makes me very pleased. <laughs> Well, 
Well, thank you, thank you so much to Fiona, to Andy, Fiona. to Tony, and to Diego. And thanks to all of you for coming out on a Sunday afternoon. That's a wrap on the Andor FYC. What an awesome panel. And we got to talk to Andy Serkis and the director was so amazing. And we got some awesome photos with Diego Luna. I mean, what more could you ask for? Don't forget to like and share and subscribe and hit the social medias and hit the buttons and all the things. Thanks for watching everyone. I am out of here.